Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wake up to a little bit of drool on my pillow, feel like it's gonna be a bad day. What's good, everyone? Welcome inside the Bucks Film Room podcast. My name is Brian Sampson. I'm your host. You can find me on Twitter at Bucks Film Room. This podcast comes at you multiple times a week. We love to really break down the Milwaukee Bucks and help you become a more knowledgeable Milwaukee Bucks and basketball fan. This is really the Bucks podcast for those smart fans out there. So really thank you for tuning in. We appreciate that. We have a really exciting episode here today where we're going to break down two really good games that the Bucks had coming out of the All-Star break. That was amazing to see. Buck a huge win on Friday night against the Minnesota Timberwolves in Minnesota and followed that up with a second straight really strong performance on both ends of the court in another win on Sunday against the Philadelphia 76ers in Philadelphia. So that was really encouraging to see. We've seen the Bucks, especially under divers, have some more of these one game highs like against the Denver Nuggets before the All-Star break where they really played well, but they followed that up with two duds, one against the Miami Heat the next night, and then one against the Memphis Grizzlies two days later. And that really left a sour taste heading into the All-Star break for the Bucs as a team. And that has not been the case coming out of the break. The Bucs look rejuvenized. They look organized. They really look ready to go. And it's been great to see that from Milwaukee in two straight games. Against the Timberwolves, that's Minnesota, or that's the Western Conference's top seed right there. That's their number one seed who's been the best team in the conference all season long, who has the best defense, if not one of the best defenses in the NBA. And Milwaukee did a really good job of being methodical and picking them apart on offense and dominating on defense. I'm just going to say dominating on defense. And it was really, really fun to see. On that, And then against the shorthanded 76ers, they played well. Without Joel Embiid, that team looks a lot different, a lot different, but it was still very encouraging to see Milwaukee get a 20-point win, basically, over the 76ers. So that's a great thing, great sign to see from the Bucs. Overall, that consistency, I mean, it was not perfect by any means. They struggled on the defensive glass against the Timberwolves, had a lot of turnovers against the 76ers, but overall, they looked very good. They looked organized. The game looked simple and slow for them. And we'll talk about that simplifying that Doc Rivers has done a lot of here during his time as the coach and how that just organization overall has really helped Milwaukee so far. It's very encouraging signs. I, I think the podcast before we went into all-star break here on Bucks Film Room podcast was a little bit of a um, Debbie Downer pod where we looked at Damian Lillard shooting struggles, why it has been as good this year. And we're going to come back to him at the end of the pod, give him his flowers. He had two tremendous games, I think, on both ends of the court. Not just, I mean, his, his scoring averages or points that he put up weren't through the roof, but I thought he played extremely well in both games. So we're going to come back to Damian Lillard, give him his flowers, and really break down what made him so special here in the last two games. Before we do that, let's touch on the defense. The devil is in the details with the Bucks defense, and they have been playing extremely well coming out of the break. Justin Garcia on Twitter or X or whatever, whatever you want to call it, he's been tracking the Bucks defensive rating, especially since Adrian Griffin got fired. So he had a tweet, I think on Sunday after the game, is that Milwaukee now has a one 111.8 defensive rating in their 15 games since firing Adrian Griffin. We drank seven seventh best in the NBA during that stretch. That's right where they need to be. If they can be in that top 10, they can optimize their offense. That's perfect. That's the recipe that John Horst in the front office was looking for when they traded away Drew Holiday and acquired an offensive-minded Damian Lillard. They can be in that top 10 on defense and have an elite offense and get back to that point, then that's perfect. That's, that's the recipe that they feel is going to win them another championship. So that's a great spot for them to be in. And really, we, we, we're seeing a lot of that defensive organization and communication that, that looks a lot better here, especially in these last two games. Let's just start at its defense at its, let's start defense at its most basic form. 
The communication by the Bucks has been tremendous coming out of the break. They are doing a lot of the same things that they did under Adrian Griffin, but little tweaks here and there. Devil is in those details. Little tweaks here and there. Their communication is way better. It's not perfect. They're still working through some things, but their communication overall has looked a lot better. They're, so they're switching one through four. That's that's kind of their primary defense, especially with Beasley and Lillard. Those two guys switch about every on-ball action and off-ball action. Jay Crowder gets in there. Giannis switches a lot as well. And then Brooke Lopez is kind of the, not kind of, he's the, the, the centerpiece of this defense where they want to funnel everything right into Brooke Lopez. So let me circle back to Brooke. On the perimeter, though, they are switching just about every action, both on ball and off ball. They're also doing scram switches. We covered that in a previous pod. So scram switch is, so say in this game against the Timberwolves, Jay Crowder spent a lot of time starting, at least, on Carl Anthony Towns. There's an on ball action. Damian Lillard or Malik Beasley would switch onto Towns as Jay Crowder took um, Anthony Edwards or he took uh, Mike Conley or whoever it would be. So then Towns would then navigate or migrate down into the post. And instead of having Beasley or Lillard, Lillard stay on Towns in the post, what would happen is come over, kick them out, and then they would go guard whoever Lopez was on their perimeter. Sometimes that was Rudy Gobert. Obviously, that presents a different challenge, but that's that scram switching is when a little on the Bucks gets switched onto a big from the other team, Brooke Lopez is usually around the hoop to be able to kick them out if their guy's trying to post them up, have them guard on the perimeter. That's We've seen a ton of that from the Bucks so far. The communication, though, I think is really big. Doc Rivers has simplified the Bucks' defense. That, that may seem odd to do, but the more simple, the simpler things are as far as what are your expectations on defense? What are you, what, what kind of coverages are you playing? Are you switching? Are you dropping? Whatever the case may be, the, the more simple that is, the simpler that is, the better or the quicker players can think about that. And the less you have to think and the quicker you can make decisions, the better. The game moves so fast in the NBA. If you falter for even half of a second, less than that, you're going to get exposed and the offense is going to take advantage of you. So the more that you can just be instinctual and, and play on your feet without having to take that extra half a second or a second to think, the better you're going to be. And that's what we're already seeing from the Bucs. I think having a practice or two coming out of the All-Star break being able to sit down with the coaching staff. Doc Rivers <clears throat> has gone through each player and has laid out the expectations for them. And that's really been helpful for this Bucks team. They really know what is expected of them. And what we really saw in two games against the Timberwolves and against the 76ers is this defense wanted to funnel everything to the middle of the court. You want to funnel everything to your defensive player of the year candidate in Brooke Lopez and to Giannis against the Timberwolves. I thought it was interesting. Giannis did not spend time guarding Carl Anthony Towns like he did in the past. Instead, he spent a lot of time on Jaden McDaniels, which allowed Giannis to play that free safety or that Romer role that we saw under Mike Budenholzer. So he spent a lot of time there. And then Brooke Lopez was on Rudy Gobert completely ignoring Gobert, which hurt them on the glass a little bit. Timberwolves got a couple of labs, but for the most part, um, Lopez was able to shut down the paint because he was always around the paint. I thought in that third quarter, Milwaukee gave up 13 points to the Timberwolves in the third quarter. That really turned the game around. They were down four or six at halftime. And then after that, they were up 13 going into or up double digits going into the fourth. I thought that all stemmed around Brooke Lopez on defense. I, I tweeted this video out, but if there was a stop on defense, Brooke Lopez was almost always at the center of it. He was always around the rim. Anytime Minnesota tried to get anything in the paint, Lopez was there to contest it. He ended up only with one block and one steal, but his impact went so much better. So that was great to see with Gobert. Bucks just let Lopez roam the rim. Their perimeter defense funneled everything right into Lopez and right into Giannis. That's exactly what you want to do with those kind of matchups. It was similar on Sunday against the 76ers when uh, Lopez was guarding Paul Reed. 
Paul Reed actually made a three-pointer in the first quarter, but he struggled with foul trouble, and Milwaukee largely ignored Paul Reed. Lopez largely largely ignored Paul Reed. And the perimeter defense, again, funneled everything right into him. That was great to see because I think ended up with five blocks. Double check me on that. Overall, Lopez was always around the rim. And again, the defense did a great job of switching, communicating, keeping their players in front of them. But when they did, when they did get past them, they funneled them right into the, their big men. So that was great to see. That's not always going to be the case against some of the teams that the Bucs will see the playoffs. But let, let's just let's go through the top of the standings here. So we got the 70 or the Celtics. That'll be a tough matchup with Porzingis. We know he can space the floor. That'll be tough for Lopez. Bucks won't be able to run anything like that. The Cavs, they can probably get away with something like that. Uh, they can with Jared Allen. Even with Evan Mobley, you can always have Giannis and uh, Lopez around the rim. Then you got the Knicks. The Knicks run out uh, either Hartenstein or Sims or Mitchell Robinson. Those are three guys that you can probably have Lopez be around the rim at. 76 There's obviously that whole equation changes with Joel Embiid. Everything changes with Embiid there. Uh, we'll see if he's healthy enough to play for the postseason, the heat. Yeah. You can't really do that with bam. Um, you know, their shooters causing the bucks issues, but against these teams with non shooters, like the Timberwolves and the 76ers, that's a great formula for success. And Milwaukee will have to adapt against some of these other teams, but overall Lopez was amazing on defense on Friday night. There are four Defensive Player of the Year awards between Rudy Gobert and Giannis, and Gobert is one of the favorites, if not the favorite, to win another Defensive Player of the Year award. But Lopez, who's the best player on the court, best defensive player on the court. So that was a great to see. Overall, that drop coverage that he's playing looks pretty similar to under Mike Budenholzer as far as Lopez's responsibilities. He's playing in that deep drop. What's completely different right now is what the perimeter defenders are doing. With um, with Budenholz, Drew Holiday and company would almost always go over the screen and then try to recover, and Lopez would be in that one-on-two. Right now, they are doing a lot of switching with that action. Um, obviously not with Lopez engaged, but a lot of switching otherwise. Their defenders will still go over the screen, but have more leeway to go under or to do different things like that. Or it's not strictly going over and fighting back into it. So that's really one of the biggest differences here. Overall, though, Brooke Lopez, I I can't say enough good things about him. The defense as a whole, they played really, really well, especially against the 76ers. They were dominant against the 76ers on Sunday. Really took them out of their rhythm had a great game. Again, I can't say enough. It was was amazing to see At, at the basics, basic understanding of this defense they their understanding is is skyrocketing the game is simple they understand what each person is supposed to do they understand their assignments and their responsibilities as individuals which them then helps them collectively as a team the communication between them has been amazing it's it's been great to see you can see jay crowder out there taking a leadership role on the court malik beasley is communicating more uh damian lillard is communicating more. It really looks looks great. There's one specific clip about midway through the third quarter that I wanted to just run through and go through with you. So it starts with Carl Anthony Towns, who's being guarded by Jay Crowder, setting a ball screen on Damian Lillard at the top of the key. So Mike Conley coming off of his screen to the left. Crowder switches on to Conley. Damian Lillard switches on to Towns. This is that scram switch that we were talking about. Towns immediately tries to go into the post, but Damian Lillard hands him off to uh, Brooke Lopez. Lopez then switches on to Towns, which is the second switch we've seen already um, in this play, and Lillard switches on to Gobert. Go the the reason that this works is because Gobert is setting a pin down screen on the right side for Anthony Edwards. So he's setting a pin down screen. Malik Beasley fights through the screen, but ultimately he needs to switch. So then Damian Lillard, this is our third switch, switches on to Anthony Edwards. Malik Beasley then switches on to Gobert. Edwards tries to drive baseline. Guess who's there? 
Brooke Lopez, because he just switched on to Towns. Towns is down on the opposite block. So Lopez is there. Anthony Edwards doesn't even look at the rim. Giannis crashes to help help the helper in case that Edwards tries to drop it off to Towns. Ultimately, Edwards skips it to the opposite corner. Giannis closes out high hands on Jaden McDaniels, forces a miss, and the Bucks end up with the ball. I thought that was just a great example of in like a six-second, eight-second time frame the Bucks executed three to four switches perfectly kept their man in front of them and ultimately funneled everything right into Lopez no shot attempt no even ability to look at the rim kick out for contested three by a poor shooter Damian Lillard was really at the heart of that defensive play and I want to talk about him some more I felt um with the last podcast Go check it out. I really did a deep dive into what's different with Damian Lillard's uh, shooting this year. He's having a down season shooting percentage wise, and you could really see that it was from a lot of areas on the court, but I want to give him his flowers on this podcast. He played what I think are two of his best all around games uh, on Friday against the Timberwolves and on Sunday against the 76ers need to give him his props. He competed. Let's, let's just start stay on defensive end of the floor. He competed as hard on that end of the court as I've seen him do in two straight games all season long. I thought that he was pretty good. He's never going to be the Drew Holiday type of lockdown defender, but he worked hard on that end of the floor. He kept his man in front of him, and he competed. He ended up with a couple of steals early on in that 76ers game simply by anticipating passes. He might not ever be a great on-ball defender, but he can be a solid off-ball defender if he stays engaged, stays locked into his man and the ball, and makes some of those reads like we saw against the 76ers. I thought that he was really good in anticipating where passes were going to go. He jumped passing lanes a couple of times to get a couple of steals. So I I just want to give him his props. That was a great... Great game by Lillard on the defensive end of the floor. Both games, he played hard. Granted, he didn't always have the toughest matchup assignments, but when him and, and when him and Beasley are constantly switching action, even though Beasley's starting out on Anthony Edwards, spending a lot of time on him, Lillard's going to get his fair share on those types of players as well. Especially in the playoffs, if they're just going to easily switch everything. And defenses or offenses are just going to go and set a simple ball screen to get a Lillard onto the guy that they want. They're going to target him like that. So I thought it was great to see him competing. Can he continue to compete at this level consistently? I hope so, because I'm a big believer. You can't just flip that switch on. It's a habit that you have to build throughout this season, and you need to be putting it into practice right now in games in the regular season so that way you understand how to apply it consistently during the postseason. So I'd love to see him continue to work on that end of the floor. Offensively, yeah, he had a very bad first half against the Timberwolves shooting the ball. I think he was one for nine. But he responded with a great second half and then a whole entire great game against the 76ers on Sunday. His Box score, as far as just total amount of points, is not going to jump off the page at you. I think he ended up with like 21 and 24 or something like that. But his command of the offense has taken another level. He looks so much more comfortable. We started to see this a little bit before the break, but especially in the last two games, he looks so much more comfortable and his understanding of the offense and what he wants has taken another level, has taken another jump and reached another level under Doc Rivers. And that's really been great to see. Doc Rivers has given him a lot of leeway to call out what he wants, to call out the sets that he wants. And what we're seeing this formula for the Bucks is Giannis for the first 42 minutes of the game, and Damian Lillard then takes, takes over down the stretch. That seems to be fine with both players where that last six minutes is really Lillard going to work. Obviously, he's going to get his shots up before then as well. Dennis is going to be involved in that clutch time offense. But overall, that's kind of the formula that that we've seen. And Lillard, his decision-making, I've been so impressed with it really all year all year long. He had a few more turnovers than I would have liked in these in these last two games. But overall, his just command of the offense, his decision-making about 
when to get his shot off, when to share the ball, when to set up teammates it has been amazing. He has such a high basketball IQ. I think that's one of the most underrated parts of his game is his basketball IQ. He knows who to go at, how to go at them, how to set up his teammates, how to keep his teammates involved, and how to hunt his own shots. That's a lot of balancing act. It's a lot of balls in the air. Again, I don't buy the reason that he struggled is because he has a lack of touches or has a lack of ball. I think it's because of other things, off-the-court things mostly. But we're really seeing him start to be engaged and understand this offense at a higher level. That's only going to improve as the season goes on. Bucks still have 24 games left. I think that was that he's going to continue to take it to the next level. I've been very, 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 very encouraged by these first two games. Lillard had nine assists and ten assists in each of these two games. And I thought that was even unselling his playmaking ability. Again, we know his shot making is there. He had a couple crazy threes against the Timberwolves, some big time shots down the stretch. But his playmaking and his dimes his assists have been on the money. I thought that was great. We need to give him his props for that. That's really, along with his basketball IQ, his playmaking for his teammates, especially on a Bucks team that has a Malik Beasley space of floor, that has Giannis that you can throw it up to. And speaking of that, we, we're seeing, I think, Lillard look for Giannis on more of these alley-oops. He had a night, nice, Lillard had a nice alley-oop where he took Nick Batum off the dribble, took him to the side of the court, and Sucked in the defense when he got into the heart of the paint and just tossed up kind of what looked like a casual lob to Giannis. Giannis just threw it down in traffic. I think Paul Reed followed him, got an and one, which was crazy. Like that, we're just seeing those who connected the different level. Uh, a little aside here, why did the Sixers had Nick Batum start and spend a lot of the game on David Lillard? That's just disrespectful. We saw Lillard get seven, I think the first seven points of the game against Philly. Like, what are you doing? Nick Batum never could guard Damian Lillard, especially not now. I, I, that was a weird assignment, but we'll take it. We will take that. Anyway, Lillard, his connection with Giannis is also improving. That's great to see. I think that he's. this is really only the start for him. I think he's turned a corner as far as his comfort level with Milwaukee and his comfort level with the Bucks, his understanding of the offense. Again, I talked about on defense how – Doc Rivers has simplified the defensive scheme and has clarified what he wants each player to do. I think that's also been the case for offense. Everybody has a specific role. We know the offense is going to be funneled through Lillard and through Giannis. When Middleton comes back, he'll be a tertiary option. He'll be another great shooter to put in that corner or the weak side. And if his defender sucks in, 38% three-point shooter, 39% three-point shooter right there which is something they lack. Jay Crowder has been nice defensively these last two games, but he struggled to shoot the ball. His defender doesn't have to respect him. When you have Crowder out there, when you have Patrick Beverly out there, when you have Pat Anton, those are kind of three shooters that defenses don't really have to pay a lot of attention to. If you replace just one of those guys with Chris Middleton, that again shifts the whole dynamic. I think defenses will still play off of Middleton to help Lillard because that – leaving Middleton is the lesser of two evils, but still that gives the Bucks another, a lot better of an offensive option when Lillard comes back, which uh, might even be as soon as next week is what it's sounding like, which is great news. That'll be another great way to step up the Bucks offense. But I thought this was a great start by Lillard and a great start by the Bucks offense as a whole. Two really encouraging games. One thing I want to talk about here quick, lastly with Lillard before we move on is his free throw attempts. There's a lot made at the beginning of the year about how often he's getting to the free throw line, how that was saving his efficiency and true shooting percentage. And, and a lot of that is true, but there's been a weird trend. Uh, his free throw attempts have completely dropped off. So in October, he averaged 9.3 free throw attempts per game. In November, it was nine. In December, it was seven. In January, it was seven and a half. And in February, it's 4.6. It really feels... Like he's not getting a lot of these grifting calls that he's gotten earlier in the year. It feels like officials have really backed away from blowing that whistle when where he's driving to the lane, kind of leans into his man and tries to throw off a 15 footer off the window. 
that feels like a, a call that he has not been getting. I've seen other players get it. For example, I saw Maxi get a couple of those. Giannis seems to get that. But Lillard, for whatever reason, it doesn't feel like he's been getting those calls as much. And as a result, his free throw rate is dropped in half from November. Like that's a, I could see a, a couple like in, in December, January is down to seven, seven and a half, but to go from nine in November to 4.6 in February, that's a huge decrease. That's, that's interesting. I think that we'll, we'll have to monitor that moving forward and Lillard's going to have to adapt his game. I'm sure he's having conversations with officials. I, I hope that they're explaining their reasoning behind that. So that way Damien can can adjust his offensive scheme or strategies, how he drives the hole, just uh, to keep an eye on here as we're moving forward. To wrap up the pod here, let's just check in on the Bucks, where they are to begin the week, what this week ahead looks like, and let's talk a little bit about March as well. So as we start here on Monday, the Bucks are in third place in the Eastern Conference. They're 37 and 21. Eight and a half games behind the first place Boston Celtics. Let's just put, all right, Boston's going to get first in the East. That's fine. Milwaukee's goal is just to stay out of that four or five seed. Two seed, obviously, two seed would obviously be perfect. Three seed, okay, we'll sell for that. That'd be okay. Uh, you don't want to be in that four or five game. You want to avoid any potential first round matchup against the 76ers, especially if Embiid is going to be back. But then specifically that second round matchup against the Celtics, you want to stay out of that. You want to avoid Boston for as long as possible. It's not that you're scared of the Celtics. It's just a math game that why why not play or why play the best team early when you could try to play them as late as possible? It's nothing to do with fear. I think Milwaukee would hold their own in that series. It's just a math game. Let's 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 keep them until the Eastern Conference Finals if you have to play them at all, if the Bucs get there at all. The big thing for the Bucs is where they're at with the Cavs. So coming out of the all-star break. Excuse me, sorry. Coming out of the All-Star break, Milwaukee was four games behind the Cavs in the loss column, which is a big one. They've already made up two of those games in just the first weekend because the Cavs lost their first two games coming out of the break. They won on Sunday, but that's big. So Bucks already caught up two games in the loss column. Overall, they're one game behind the Cavs. Uh, so Bucks are 37 and 21. Cleveland is 37 and 19. That's doable. These two teams do not play each other the rest of the year. Milwaukee has the fifth hardest schedule, depending on which metric you're using, but we'll say the fifth hardest schedule. So Milwaukee really has some work to do. But that was an encouraging thin uh, arms reach here. One game back of them. Let's see what happens the rest of the season. Overall, this week is a big one. So Bucks beat two quality playoff opponents here to start. And now they have a little bit of a reprieve. On Tuesday, they play uh, at home against the Charlotte Hornets. On Thursday, they play at the Charlotte Hornets. And then on Friday, in a back-to-back, -back, they play at Chicago Bulls, which is another 9 o'clock Central Time game on ESPN, which, which is kind of weird. That Two Fridays in a row, they'll be playing in Minnesota and in Chicago uh, at 9 o'clock. But either way, so this is a big week for the Bucs. They need all three of these games. Uh, they need to continue to rack up the wins. Let's get to, what did I say they were, 37-21. Let's get to 40-21 and, and, and see what happens from there. The reason they need all three wins is because they have a bloodbath in March. March is very difficult. It will definitely prep them for the playoffs if, if we want to take a glass half full look. But beginning on March 4th, they have eight straight games against teams with winning records. So the, we know this week they got the Hornets twice and the Bulls. But then next Monday they play the Clippers, then they play the Warriors, the Lakers, the Clippers, the Kings, the 76ers, the Suns, the Celtics. Then they get kind of a one-game break against the Nets, and then it's right back to the Thunder, the Lakers, and the Pelicans before wrapping up March with the Hawks. So it's 11 games in March alone against teams with the winning records. That's tough. You need every win that you can get now. It gives you a little bit of wiggle room for a slip-up later in March. Hopefully that does not happen. But getting these three wins is important. We know Milwaukee. We've seen them consistently, really, under Doc Rivers, play some good games against good teams. Where they've slipped up is against poor teams. They lost to the shorthanded Miami Heat, lost to the very shorthanded Memphis Grizzlies. Can they avoid that same trap against the Hornets and then against the Bulls? Those are pesky. 
They're four games under 500. They're pesky. They're not going to give Milwaukee any. You can't just walk into that game or sorry, Bulls are three games under 500. You can't just walk into that game specifically and expect the game to be handed to you. Uh, Chicago is going to play hard. They're going to try to give the Bucks fits against Charlotte. And Charlotte can be frisky too. Let's just see what happens here. But Bucks need to take care of business. They need to end this week hard. This is great start. These two games are a great start. They built some momentum. Don't give that up. You need to carry that momentum. Let's get a nice win streak here. Let's build our win streak to five games here heading into this tough stretch in March. That would be tremendous. I mean, obviously, you want to win every game. I'm not saying anything new. But just call out their schedule and where it's at. Let's keep the momentum going. Keep building good habits. Keep stacking success to bring back old Mike McCarthyism from the Green Bay Packers. Let's start stacking success. You have the first building block in place now. Let's get another one in place before next week. That's all I have for you today. Thank you all for tuning in. You can find me on Twitter at Bucks Film Room. I think I failed to mention this at the top, but I write about the Milwaukee Bucks for Forbes Sports. And you can check out this podcast a couple times a week. Thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time.